All right. What am I going to do a video on? What am I going to do a video on? Let's see. Aw, kittens. Yeah, I can't get distracted right now. Later. Pat Robertson. Some of these cults, but they would come by and say, uh, trick or treat. And the trick was that they were to kill one of your animals or hurt you. Mm. And if you didn't give them some food. So, uh, okay. Uh, let's see. White Horse Media. And again, it doesn't, the Bible doesn't differentiate between good sorcerers and bad sorcerers, between those who practice white magic or black magic. It says that all witchcraft and all sorcery is dangerous and it is uh, okay let's see huh this looks interesting the abortion matrix i wonder what this is about witchcraft black masses infant blood sacrifice it does seem far-fetched that's the video that's the video hey ned fire up the green screen we got us some video making to do. Mm. Ah, that's hot. So one thing to keep in mind is they are calling this video Modern Witchcraft and Child Sacrifice. Entering the modern era in 15th century Italy. Modern era? You do realize that these people back in 1484 were paranoid, delusional, and running around burning people at the stake and hanging them to death. That is not the modern times. Pope Innocent VIII was so concerned about the rise of witchcraft that he commissioned Kramer and Sprenger's famous Malus Maleficarum, a treatise on witchcraft. Commissioned in 1484, the treatise repeatedly links witchcraft to abortion and child sacrifice. Not exactly. The Malefus Maleficarum talks about abortion, but in the context of the either witches or a devil or some kind of an evil spirit causing an abortion. So just for an example, here's a, all of the instances where the word abortion is used in the Malefus Macarium, which is nine times. So check these out. So the Malefus Macarium is talking about the infliction of abortion upon a woman, not the voluntary process of an abortion. So it's kind of a different context. Witches who were midwives in various ways kill the child conceived in the womb and procure an abortion. There's the remainder of this sentence which he is conveniently leaving out so i'm going to put this up on a screen for you right here during the reign of louis the 14th for example there was a network of occult activity involving abortion and infanticide that reached even into the king's courts 
No, if you are talking about what I think you're talking about, you are talking about a period during the reign of Louis the Fourteenth, where a couple of people died, and all these nobles who were all stuck into one area, following Louis the Fourteenth around as he dressed and as he ate, and just watching him do all these things. And so they got into all this infighting and people were accusing each other of poisoning people. And then the poisoning led to witchcraft and then to black masses and then to, it was just a circus of paranoid delusional activity. And historians today look at this period and they don't take it too seriously as for the accusations that came out of this period. It was just infighting between nobles and power plays and figuring out ways to get rid of people and accusing people of this. And it was just a crazy paranoid time. Investigating a series of suspicious deaths, the Lieutenant General of the police in Versailles was led to Madame de Montespan, Louis' favorite lover, and then to La Voisin, a practicing witch and abortionist who had provided the poisons used in the murders. This is one of the most famous cases that came out of the 422 people who were accused of being poisoners. So 422 people gives you an idea of how widespread this activity was. La Vosan was one of the people who was implicated, but she was also rather high on the pecking order of nobility at that time. And so she made a lot of news, but Basically, she was just accused of being a poisoner. Same with all the other 420 odd people who were accused of this. And she gave a confession. She and she gave a confession under intoxication. And then she was tortured. And when she was tortured, she claimed she had done all these things. Upon further investigation, he learned that the abortion services were connected with satanic rituals and being primarily performed for members of the aristocracy. Puis je vous présenter Catherine Dessé, veuve mon voisin, dite la voisin. Spécialiste des poudres de succession, bouillon de 11 heures, aiguilles et autres instruments, messe noire. C'est une condamnation. Non, c'est ma raison sociale. Et le tout sans danger. Je le garantis. Comme le dit madame, rien ne vaut une empoisonneuse pour éviter d'être empoisonnée. But she was accused of being a poisoner. That's what she was accused of being. And then witchcraft and these other trumped up charges came about and she was eventually burned at the stake on February 22nd of I'll put the date down, but she was she was burned at the stake for being a witch. J'en appelle à Samael, prince des abîmes, qui l'accorde à Athénaïs, marquise de Montesquieu. The following is the testimony of La Voisin's daughter at the subsequent trial. Oh, come on. Now you're using a play? Basically, it was kind of like an opera musical about Louis XIV? This is the best you can come up with? At one of Madame de Montespan's masses, I saw my mother bring an infant, obviously premature, and place it over a basin over which its throat was slit and its blood drained into the chalice. Yeah, but where are you getting this testimony from? Note that the child was premature, likely the victim of one of the many abortions La Voisin had performed. Then the cup filled with the baby's blood was lifted up to heaven and this invocation was given. Hail Ashtaroth and Asmodeus, princes of friendship. I conjure you to accept the sacrifice of this child in return for the favors asked of you. Ashtaroth was the goddess wife of Moloch. Asmodeus is a transliteration of the Hebrew name for a demon that is normally associated with lust. Aborted children as well as infants purchased from prostitutes and the very poor were being sacrificed in a satanic ritual designed to grant spiritual power to the practitioners. Is this your opinion that you are sharing now or is this based upon something? Because 
you're not giving any citation or where you're getting this. I don't know if you're getting this from the movie or if you're getting this from the play that you're showing, but you're not giving us the source for this information. So I'm assuming that it's just your opinion that you were sharing at this point. At her trial, Lavoisin confessed that no less than 2,500 babies had been disposed of in this manner. Mm, yes and no. First of all, she was tortured and would have confessed to anything. And the babies were not abortions and they were not child sacrifice. They were supposed to be the bones that were ground up to make poisons that killed people. That's what she was accused of doing was poisoning people and killing people. And by the way, back then abortion was illegal. Abortion was basically, you would be put to death for it, not only in mother, but also the midwife. So abortion back then is not something that you went around talking about that you did or claimed to do. And if you did claim to do it, it was a death sentence. Historians debate whether these tales of satanic masses and rumors of ritual infant sacrifice are in fact reliable. It's not reliable. The debate is over. Were they coaxed out of frightened witnesses by the Lieutenant General of the Police in Versailles, who used torture as part of his interrogation techniques? You might be getting a little warmer. Or were these simply folk rituals combined with elements of the Catholic Mass that served to assuage the conscience of La Voisin as she came to terms with the moral implications of the many abortions she had performed. I have no idea where you're getting this. Are you just pulling this out of your ass? In the book, Affair of the Poisons, Murder, Infanticide, and Satanism in the Court of Louis XIV, author Anne Somerset offers this explanation. La Voisin appears genuinely to have believed in the power of magic but she combined this with an outward profession of piety. As the circumstances of her arrest suggested, she was a regular churchgoer, and her answers to her interrogators would abound with devout sentiments and respectful invocations of the good Lord. When she finally began to make significant revelations, she would claim she was doing so for the glory of the Lord, who had commanded her to heed his will as she knelt in prayer. Earlier in her career, her readiness to imply that she was in tune with the workings of providence had stood her in good stead, for clients were comforted by her apparent belief that her personal activities were compatible with Christianity. It may be that La Voisin herself was scarcely aware of any contradiction. Once, having assisted at an abortion, she was said to have wept tears of joy when the midwife in attendance baptized the fetus. Far from being troubled at having terminated the unborn child's existence, she exulted in having been instrumental in securing its salvation. Well, first of all, thank you for actually giving me a source and a page number. And unfortunately, Ann Somerset wrote a good book here but it's fiction. It's based on historical events, but even Anne herself on page two says that when researching a subject, every historian is dependent upon the quality of the sources and the affair of the poisons poses certain difficulties with this respect. Letters written at the time of the affair are in some ways more reliable, but here too, there are pitfalls. Witchcraft? Black masses, infant blood sacrifice, it does seem far-fetched. It's no wonder that some historians are skeptical. No, historians aren't skeptical. They already understand what was going on during this period in Louis XIV's court. But when we consider the culture of the time, the picture comes into sharper focus. 
The French Renaissance saw the revival of interest in the Greek and Roman gods. King Louis XIV himself loved paintings with mythological themes and had a particular fascination with the sun god Apollo. Yeah, this is true. He was a person who was always on display and he enjoyed that. He was a skilled dancer and he loved having the spotlight on him. And yes, he probably did consider himself to be a deity as many kings before him monarchs going way back to even Egyptian times believed that they were the chosen ones by the gods or whoever. In paintings of that era, Louis is portrayed as the Sun King. Lavoisin, no doubt, shared Louis's fascination with pagan gods and goddesses. Lavoisin was a very devout Christian woman. She probably completely shied away from pagan gods because she was a good Christian woman. She mixed this with a kind of folk witchcraft, herbalism, astrology, and the concoction of love potions and various poisons, including potions used to induce abortion. Lavoisin's vocation as a poisoner is, in fact, the most documented element of the affair. The 1997 film Marquis depicts the story of a young actress, played by Sophie Marceau, who purchases poison from La Boussin in order to murder her husband so she might be free to marry her lover. Yes, of course. Yes. Despite what you are trying to create out of what happened in during this very paranoid, superstitious time, Lavosan was accused of being a poisoner. That was the whole point of this. So it's not that it was the most elaborate or most known part of her case. It was the case. She was accused of being a poisoner. I don't know why you don't understand this. Likely in the minds of Lavoisin and others who practice these abominations, they were doing a good thing in providing abortion to women whose children were products of adultery, fornication, and incest. Oh. I understand that you are going to the most extreme lengths to connect these paranoid superstitions that happened during the 16th, the middle of the 16th century in France with abortion today. And I understand you are taking these things and you are stretching them so thin to make a connection here, but it's simply not there. Whether or not these dark ceremonies incorporating the blood of babies butchered through abortion were consciously meant to be satanic, only God knows. Yeah, let's just skip through the actual facts of what happened historically. Let's immediately just take this all for an assumption and just jump to the conclusion and now try to get into her mindset and understand why she was able to reconcile and accept this, let alone the fact that it didn't happen this way. But what is apparent is that elements of witchcraft and pagan religion were interspersed with Christian rituals in order to justify the horrific crime of child murder. You're just making up your own stuff at this point. You're not basing this on any historical evidence. But is this really that different from what we still see going on today? Yes, it's very different from what we see going on today. We're here at the Orlando Women's Center. I'm a part of a team that meets here on Saturday mornings. I've had people stand here and tell me on numerous occasions that, that they're sure that they're sending their baby straight to heaven, that their baby is in the arms of Jesus from coming to this abortion clinic and killing their baby. I've spoken to pastors about this and some well-known ones that are absolutely in shock and cannot believe that somebody that claims to be a Christian could believe such a thing.
Really, have you also been placed in a position where you had to make one of the most hardest decisions you ever had to do in your entire life? You scraped together the money, whatever, you, however you could to go and go to this clinic to have a surgery performed only to be taunted by an audience of Christians wielding cross. And once you've had the surgery performed and you're already not only physically, but emotionally drained, you have to be led away and again, go through this gauntlet of jackals who are yelling and screaming. And a North Texas doctor who performs abortions is back in the spotlight this midday. His clinic shut down a while ago, but now he's reopened a surgery center. He is now the only doctor in the area who will perform late-term abortions. That's for women who are up to six months pregnant. It's no surprise that he's been the target of protest, but as KVU's Jim Douglas shows us, there is a surprise in the doctor's story. Am I killing? Yes, I am. I know that. It's a jarring admission from anyone, especially from a doctor, and perhaps even more so from this doctor. I'm an ordained Baptist minister. He's now a Unitarian who says he prays often. And then I'll ask that the spirit of this pregnancy be returned to God with love and with understanding. The notorious abortionist George Tiller, who was shot to death in 2009. Wait, let's, let's hear that again. The notorious abortionist George Tiller, who was shot to death in 2009. Tiller was a target of anti-abortion extremists. His Wichita clinic was bombed in 1985, and then at the age of 67, he was murdered at church. Yes, George Tiller was murdered. He was shot dead for performing abortions. So all these people on the right who are waving these crosses and talking about how evil it is that these doctors are performing these surgeries on women who need, possibly for medical necessity, having to abort their babies. They're talking about how horrible it is that they are killing these unborn George babies. Tiller was a target of anti-abortion extremists. So and how was do they solve this problem? By at the killing age of 67, he was a murdered doctor? Sure. Employed a resident chaplain in his late-term abortion clinic. Observers outside the clinic would note the frequent smoke arising from an incinerator chimney as babies were cremated inside the building. Tiller's website advertised baptisms, funeral services, celebrations, and blessings for the aborted fetus prior to being burned in the incinerator. No woman, at least no woman that I've known, has woke up one day and found out they were pregnant and said, you know, I think I'll go and get an abortion. It's not that, it's not that kind of a decision. It's usually a very difficult decision. They may not know that they are pregnant until later on and they find out that they're pregnant. It may be that they find out that their baby is going to die anyhow. It may be they were raped and they got pregnant. It may be that they just decide that they're not prepared to be a mother, which is a very responsible position to take. A lot of people go into motherhood and fatherhood completely unprepared to provide for a child for its entire life. It is a very big decision to become a parent. So these people who go through all of these various scenarios in their mind who do decide that it may be best to just go ahead and have an abortion have already thought about all of these consequences and unfortunately have come to the decision that they have to seek an abortion. Going against their own maternal instincts they decide to have an abortion. And afterwards, from what I have heard and what I have experienced from other people, not firsthand, but knowing people who have gone through this experience, it's very draining. It's not a, they're not skipping out of that clinic.
Whether intentional or naive, blatant or hidden, there is a growing association of abortion with these bizarre religious rituals, including witchcraft. No, no, there isn't. You are taking clips of a movie. You're taking a passage from a book of fiction. You're blending it together with the court of Louis XIV, which you call modern, which was filled with all kinds of soap opera back and forth between these rich nobles who had nothing better to do except gossip and make up stuff. And then you combine it together with this idea that witchcraft and child sacrifice are somehow combined. This abortion clinic in Seattle, Washington, Aradia Women Health Center, for example, was named for the goddess associated with witchcraft. Aradia is an alleged figure of Italian folklore in Charles Godfrey Leland's Aradia, or the Gospel of the Witches. According to Leland, Aradia is the daughter of the goddess Diana and Lucifer, who came to earth to teach witchcraft to her oppressed worshipers. Yeah, it's pretty much known that a lot of the only protection that clinics and women who wanted to get abortions were other women. And a lot of these women were witches. They were pagans. They were people who were not of, Ebra uh, not of Abrahamic faiths. And so they were the ones who gave the money. They were the ones that gave the support. They were the ones who held women's hands when they had to go through this experience and they went with them through this experience to help them through it. So it is no surprise that a clinic, one clinic in Seattle, would be named after Aradia. Century folklorists compiled the book as an attempt to portray the beliefs and rituals of an underground religious witchcraft tradition that, Leland claimed, had survived for centuries until his discovery of its existence in the 1890s. The Gospel of Aradia became the first real text of the 20th century witchcraft revival. So this is the end of the first video in an eight-part series called The Abortion Matrix. So thank you so much for watching and bless you.